Amen. Amen. Wow, we are finally, we're at the end of what seems like a very long February. Um, but it's been a tremendous time. You know, we started and we launched the year 2024 uh, laying and relaying some foundations. How many of you know that if the house is going to be strong, the foundation has to be strong? Amen? Amen. And, so, um, and so we began uh, this year uh, in January. We spent the entire month relaying a foundation of prayer. Because how many of you know that if you ain't praying... <laughs> It was free. Um, I mean, if you're not praying, none of the other work that you're doing really matters in that moment. Amen? Amen. And so we relayed a foundation of prayer. And so some of the things that have been happening since that time, we have restarted our intercessory prayer team. And so even this morning, as you guys came in, there was a team that has been praying for what God wants to do in this place. We're getting ready to revive our altar prayer team here because we need more prayer warriors. Amen? Amen. Um, We're getting ready to launch an online prayer team and also regular prayer nights. We had a prayer night uh, here in January. Uh, Just this month in February, we had the opportunity to join with other churches in our community to pray. Some of you were able to be there for that. It was a powerful, powerful night, and we've got more of those coming. So relaying that foundation of prayer, because prayer really changes things. I sincerely believe that. Can anybody else testify to that in this place this morning? (laughs) Second thing we really uh, wanted to do is identify and clarify our vision. And the vision is simply this, to become... A community that reflects the image and the likeness of Jesus to our city and beyond. And I believe that when we are loving God with everything that we have and with everything that we are, and when we are truly loving our neighbors as if they were our own kin, Jesus said, you have fulfilled all of the law and all of the prophets in those two things. Jesus also said, let your light shine. And so when we do this and when we begin to love in this way and we begin to, to um, out of the goodness and out of the overflow of our heart, begin to serve and to love others, we're letting our light shine. And when we do that, we're reflecting not our own light. Because how many of you know there's not a whole lot of goodness in us by ourselves? All right? Y'all don't get the opportunity to live in my space. It's a dark place sometimes. And I know that anything good that comes from me is simply a reflection of the sun. Jesus Christ is shining through us. So number three, we wanted to confirm our mission. And it's a simple one, simply to inspire people to follow Jesus. You know, we have it stated there to inspire people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. I just want people following Jesus. How about you? He said he's the way, he's the truth, he's the light. He says no one comes into the Father except by him. Guys, this is the job. Jesus said go into the world and make disciples. And so we look to Jesus and how did Jesus do that? I was talking with the staff this week and I said, you know, it's amazing when you think about the story of the woman at the well, how in the world does a simple request for a cup of water turn into the salvation of an entire city? Think about that. Jesus didn't like think this through in his mind, like, okay, I'm gonna do this. And then she's gonna say this. And then I'm going to do this. And then she's, that's not how that went down. You know, I think about the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector, the short man. Couldn't see over the crowds. How does an invitation to dinner turn into the salvation of a household? It's Jesus creating and, 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 and creating this space for people to be able to not only hear, but to experience the kingdom of heaven. Number four, we talked about um, and establishing our strategy. Yes, we want, we want uh, to inspire people to follow Jesus, but our strategy here at TFC is simply to create and then invite people into environments that mirror the values of heaven. Jesus was all about, in fact, God was. How many of you know that that was Adam's first job was to work with God to create an environment? We call it earth or the garden. What are our environments, our worship environments? Did anybody other than me experience the presence of God this morning in this place? 
You know, this is an environment, our next gen environment. Y'all represent, where's my next gen at? They're like, it's been a long weekend. (laughs) It's been awesome. But creating environments where they can thrive, our small group environments, our outreach environments, and, and, and our digital environments. Whether you like it or not, we are in a digital world. Amen. Let's keep that moving. Um, God has always been in the, vi- in the business of creating environments. Um, we talked about Adam here just a, just a quick second. How many of you know what Adam's occupation was? Like he had a job? <laughs> he had a job. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2 that God placed him in the garden to tend it and to keep it. Adam was a gardener. <laughs> And he was under God's instruction and under God's rule. He was going to take creation somewhere. A lot of us, we tend to think of the Garden of Eden. And we tend to think it's just this perfect garden where nothing ever happens. How many of you guys have a garden? Do you see what happens to it if you don't mess with it for a few days? Right? It's going to grow somewhere. But God set man in the garden to say, no, I want you to take my creation and guard it and guide it into the direction that's going to bring me glory and bring me honor and bring me praise. And so he does that. But then Adam falls, gets fired, loses his job. The, the land no longer listens to him. And this is the beautiful thing for me. Guys, fast forward all the way into the time of Jesus. Jesus has been crucified. It's the third day. They go to the tomb. I love this. Mary Magdalene is there after all the others, Peter and John, they leave and go back trying to figure out what's happened. John, the Bible says that John believed immediately, but he wrote that book. So, right. Um, So, but we do know that Mary is still sitting there and two angels ask her the question and say, Hey, what are you looking for? You know, and, 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 she turns and she sees another man standing there. And the Bible says, supposing that he was the gardener. Do you see what happened there? It's almost like Jesus, who, by the way, the Bible calls the last Adam, is picking up where Adam left off. Creating environments. Because you know what he's saying is not even sin can stop the plan of God. Nothing can stop God from moving and creating and, and, and generating these, these environments. I love the words of author John Comer. He writes these words. He says, we're called to a very specific kind of work to make a garden-like world where image bearers can flourish and thrive and where people can experience and enjoy God's generous love. A kingdom where God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven where the glass wall between earth and heaven is so thin and so clear and translucent that you don't even remember it's there. That's the kind of world we're called to make. After all, we're just supposed to continue what God started in the beginning. Amen? I love that quote. This is the reason why we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we're going to close out this series. We're going to close out this season of foundation laying and, 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 and foundation rebuilding with those very, very words of Jesus, how he taught us to pray that simply says in Matthew 16, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How many of you've prayed that prayer at some point along the line, whether from your heart or you know, if you went to a, a, a Christian school or whatever, you've been taught to pray that certain way. But what I want us to do is I want to take a look at three things um, in there. That when we're praying these things, what are we actually praying? What are we admitting? And what are we asking God to do? The first one is this. We're admitting that God's will is not fully yet established. You know, um, a lot of times we walk around with this idea that God's will is always going to get done. How many of you have heard the verse that says that it is not God's will that any should perish? But how many of you know that at the end of the day, some are still going to perish? You know, it's one of those conundrums that's there in, in, in Scripture 
There are things that God wants to see and God wants to establish, but for reasons that I don't fully understand and, and neither do you actually is why God actually chose to give us free will. And by, by introducing free will into the equation, there's the admission that there are some things that are going to happen that God didn't want to happen. I know that's going to mess with some of our heads and I know it messes with some of our theology. It messes with my theology, but it's just, it's just the way that it is. But there are some things in this world that currently, as of yet, God's kingdom is not entered into. And you need to realize that when God says he loves the whole world, you need to realize that he loves the whole person, not just your spirit, but he loves you spirit, soul, and body. We have unwittingly adopted an idea in Christendom, Western Christianity, that somehow God cares only about the spiritual part of our existence. And what you need to know is that is not a teaching that is steeped in Judaism or in Christianity. It's actually Greek. It's actually part of Greek mythology that says that the flesh is ultimately of no use and that only thing that matters is the spirit. And so the existence of life is to throw away anything that has to do with our bodies, anything that has to do with, with our, our resources and only focus on spiritual matters. But the Bible says that there's going to be a resurrection of the dead for a reason. How many of you are looking forward to that day? I've got loved ones that are in the ground. I've got, uh, if, if time permits, one day I will be in the ground. But the Bible says that one day he's going to come with a shout, with the voice of an archangel. And it says the dead in Christ will Guys, I'm telling you, it's not a spiritual rising. It's an actual rising. Just like Jesus didn't just spiritually rise from the dead. He actually rose from the dead. Can I get an amen from somebody this morning? So we realize that in our homes, in our lives, in our communities, there are places where his rule has not yet being accomplished. God wants us to prosper. I know that because the Bible says that. May you prosper even as your soul prospers. How many of you want to prosper? How many of you want to set your hand to something and see it succeed? The rest of you aren't telling the truth. So when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, we're admitting that, man, there's some places in this life and in this world, in my life and in my world, where his rule has not yet been established. Number two, what are we praying for? I love this. Ultimately, we're praying for the return of Jesus. Because all of the things that are wrong with the world, you know, people have often said, if there's a God, why do so many bad things happen? How many of you guys know bad things happen to good people? And the reason that happens is because we're in a world that's broken and we're in a world that's fallen. And we say, well, then why doesn't God fix it? Hold on. Because he's coming to fix it. That is the promise of his return. Let me encourage you with this passage. And I didn't put it up because I wanted you guys to just listen. Because these are the final words of the Bible. This is how the whole book from Generations to Revolutions, I mean, Genesis to Revelations ends. (laughs) Right? These are the last words, and they're the words of Jesus himself. And it says this in in Revelation 22, verses 12 through 20, if you're taking notes. Look, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me. I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to eat of the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my messenger to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride. Is anybody the bride here this morning? Say come. And let the one who hears say come. And let the one who is thirsty come. 
Let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecies of this scroll, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this scroll. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. And I love these last words. John says, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And when we pray that prayer, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. You need to know that what we are doing is we are saying, Lord Jesus, we realize that nothing in this world is ultimately going to be fixed until you get here. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm ready. Are y'all ready? Amen. Amen. The third thing and the final thing that when we were praying that prayer is this. We are committing ourselves to go. Um, a lot of times when you, how Jewish, the Jewish mindset in prayer, a lot of times is very different from, the, from our mindset. Um, a lot of times we pray just so we can feel better. Let's be honest. I prayed about it and I went and now I, have, I got this peace. And everything we do is based on how we feel. It, man, I got peace about it. And so now I just left it alone. But what you need to know very often in scripture and in, and in the Jewish tradition, people would pray things because they're getting ready to enter into things. One of the examples of that is, is Nehemiah um, before he went to the king. And you need to understand going to the king was not like going to a president or going to a government official back in those days. Um, your life literally hung on the balance of whether the king got up on the right or the wrong side of the bed that day. All right, you might have had the greatest idea to save all of humanity, but if the king was not in a good, me- good mood, you're done. Like forever done. Does everybody understand that? And so, and not only that, but you're a lowly Jewish peasant. You're, you're, you're part of a conquered people. This nation came in and took your city, destroyed your temple, destroyed everything about you. And now a new king who was actually more powerful than the last king because he defeated the last kingdom is there. And you're going to go before this guy and possibly lose your life. And Nehemiah offers a prayer to God. And he begins to ask for favor. As he goes to the king. Why was he asking for favor? Because he was going to get up and go to that king. Do you guys see what I'm saying here? And so when we pray that prayer and say, Father, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're saying that because we intend to go. Jesus, as he was going through the towns and the villages, saw the crowds and had compassion on them. Because they're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he turned to his disciples in Matthew chapter 9 and he said these words. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his fields. Folks, that's why we pray. That's what we pray. That's why some of you are here this morning. You you thought you were here to get an education from UF or Santa Fe. You thought you had this idea that just popped in your head that said, hmm, let's move to Gainesville. You're here because literally somebody's been praying, Lord, send laborers into the fields. Send laborers into the fields. We don't have everything that we need. If you're here, you're here today because God has uniquely gifted you. God has uniquely put some things inside of you that frankly no one else can do just the way that you do it. But he says, I need them into this, to fold them into this community, into this place, into this thing, so that together we might go into the field that is ripe for harvest. You guys remember I told you the story of the woman at the well and how that conversation turned into uh, the salvation of a city. Jesus is talking there, and, and, and I love how this, this, this works out because afterwards she goes back to the city. And Jesus said this in John 4, 35. Don't you have a saying? that it's four months until the harvest? I tell you this, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Let me paint the picture of what's happening here. The disciples came back and they saw Jesus talking to a woman, which like, 
was like really weird for them. Like that was weird enough. And then they find out that she's a Samaritan woman. This is a woman whose entire country has basically rejected the, the claims of Israel, rejected that God is even in Jerusalem. They're, they're kind of a lower class of people in the Jewish mind than Jewish people, um, sometimes referred to as dogs. Um, and Jesus is talking to them. She now has heard the gospel and has gone back to her city into a city where she is, is, is of low status. The reason she was out there at noon is because all the respectable people were, came early in the morning. So she was not somebody that anybody would have looked at as an authority. But she has gone and following behind her is the entire city of Samaria. And so I can only imagine what's going through the minds of the disciples that in their mind are thinking, we shouldn't even be here. We shouldn't even be hanging out here. But now this entire city's coming. And Jesus says this. He says, he says, open your eyes and look. The fields are ripe for harvest. Church, one of the things we've got to stop doing is you've got to stop looking out at our city and saying, well, that generation's just really hard to reach. They just, nobody can reach that generation. We got to stop saying it's impossible. We stop, the words to Jesus in that day is the words to us today. Open your eyes and look out into the fields. They are ripe for harvest. They're ready. They want to hear. I know because I have the conversations. I had opportunity to have lunch with with Pastor Mike over at Greenhouse, and we went to go have a simple lunch. And it it was amazing to see how easy it was to strike up a conversation with a young man in line because he was eavesdropping into our conversation about broccoli. Went to a restaurant. They don't serve broccoli anymore. We were lamenting that they don't serve broccoli. And how does a conversation about broccoli turn into a conversation about the kingdom of heaven? God wants to use you. He wants to use me. And when we pray that, we're saying that we're ready to go. Because those were the marching orders. Go. Make disciples. My mind and my heart often goes to the words of of the Lord as he was crying out and the prophet Isaiah heard him and he said this, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go? And I believe that that is the words of the Lord to us this morning. We know that we're gonna build a foundation of prayer. We know that we're gonna focus on becoming a people who reflect the image and the likeness of God. We know that we're called to go, but the question still remains, and I still hear the Spirit of the Lord saying to us, Who will go? Who will go? And I hope that your response this morning is the same as Isaiah's. Here I am. Send me. I want us to bow our heads. We had a great time of worshiping with the king this morning, a great time of, of just um, experiencing the presence of God in this place. We had a, uh, a wonderful time of, of, of um, just sharing with one another and reuniting. You know, our young people are coming off of an incredible weekend where, where I've just been reported to me that two of them gave their lives to Jesus this weekend. And just, just um, yes, we're seeing God move in incredible incredible ways um, throughout our, our campus. But the reality is, is there are hundreds of thousands in our city, in our community that do not have the option or the ability to experience what heaven might be like, what it would be like to be in an environment where you are loved unconditionally, that we are people who, who, who realize our, that, 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 that there's a place where you can be known and still loved. <laughs> and he said, who will go? As for me and my family, because I can't speak for everybody, but as for me and my household, our answer is yes. What about you this morning? And I realize that in a, in a group this large and, and with people watching online, that there are people that, are, that have never actually taken that initial step across what I call the threshold of faith. You may have gone to church, you may be into the God thing, 
not into the church thing, but you're into spirituality. But at the end of the day, we know and we believe and we preach that Jesus is the way. He's the truth and he's the life. He's the way back to the Father. And he said, no one comes to the Father except by me. There are times in my life I don't like that. But some things are just the way they are. And I believe that it is just the way it is. And so at some point, every one of us, either now or at some point in the future, will bow the knee. And every tongue will confess, Jesus, your Lord. I chuckle a little bit when I realize that even Satan will bow the knee. Not because he's forced to, but because of the unoverwhelming evidence where he says, I've seen it all. I've been there since the beginning. And now I confess, you are Lord. It's coming. My appeal to you this morning is don't wait till that day. Do it now. And each day, when I wake up, I am asking myself the same question. Today, are you Lord? Because to make Jesus Lord is not just a decision that we write on a piece of paper, put it in our notebook and say, on that day I did it. But it's the beginning of a journey. It's the beginning of saying, not only am I going to walk with Jesus, but I'm going to join with a community of people who are walking with Jesus. Because how many of you know you're not greater than your environment? A good friend of mine taught me this. He says, count the five closest people in your life. He says, you're the average of those five people. Didn't like it, was mad at him, didn't talk to him for a few weeks. But I lived a little bit of life. And I realized that's actually true. Our environment matters. And then finally, the call is still to go. That's the job. But the beauty of it is he didn't call us to go alone. Even when he had the 12, he sent them out two by two. When he had the 70, he sent them out two by two. And so when he said go into all the world, he meant go together into all the world. And as you go, make disciples. And so if that's you this morning, and we're going to do this all together, you're either saying, I'm ready to bow the knee to Jesus, or you're simply saying, I'm ready to go together to see his kingdom come and his will be done. I'd like for you to stand. Because I want to pray for you. It's okay not to. It really is. I'd rather you... I'd rather, I'd rather you stayed seated and said, I need to think about this than to stand just because everybody's standing. But allow God to do what God wants to do. There's no pretense here. There's no, nobody's looking at you funny because you did or you didn't. But I just want to pray for you. Father, the call is to go. And so help us. Lord, there are some that are standing. That they're standing because they're saying, I'm ready to make Jesus Lord. I'm ready to go and do things his way. I'm, I'm ready to, I've tried my way and it doesn't seem to work out the way I'm planning. But you are the way. You have already gone before. So I, I bow the knee. I, I accept the gift that you've given to me of salvation. I believe that God raised you physically from the dead. And I'm confessing right now that you're the Lord. You're king. Your way, not mine. Father, I pray for them, Lord, that they would take this to heart, that this word would find root in their spirit, that, Lord, after they leave here and even go out to their next location, Lord, that it'll still be alive and active in them and that they would find community, if not here, then somewhere, so that they might know the fellowship of the spirit and the fellowship of the saints, as many of us do. Now, Father, I pray for the rest who are here that are standing saying, listen, I hear your call. Here am I. Send me. Because I know that even as you sent us in Matthew, that you said, and I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. I will be with you until the very end of the age. Jesus, we trust you. And Father, we entrust that with you and we move forward with you together. Thank you, Lord God, that we are never alone. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we ask these things. Amen. Amen.
and amen. Let's all stand together. I'm going to go ahead and call my um, call our elders uh, to come on and make their way to the front. And if you've been with us this morning, God has a work and a plan for you as an individual. Do you believe that? And he's got a plan for us together as a community of faith at the family church. Do you believe that? You know, last week, many of you guys sent out those cards. You guys filled out a stack of cards like this high. You broke our internet. Um, so you, not really. You, you just broke some of our workers. <laughs> So if you haven't heard back from us yet, it's coming and we'll get back with you this week because there's so much work to do. And it's the little things to the big things. Right now, a little thing is candy. We need candy. Why? Because kids love candy and we want to bribe them to come, (laughs) right? Anything works, right? Um, But we also continue to need people who are willing to say, man, I'm willing to step in and do what it takes to see God's kingdom come, to see his will be done in my lifetime, folks. I ain't gonna be here long and neither are you, whether you believe it or not. In the span of history, 100 years is a short time. 50 years is even shorter. So let's get it done. Or as I like to say, get her done. Listen, if if you prayed that prayer this morning saying, listen, I'm making Jesus Lord for the first time, our connect cards are right in the front of this because that journey doesn't end when you say the prayer, it begins. And we want to walk with you. We want to rejoice with you. The Bible says there's more rejoicing in heaven over one person who comes into the fold than the 99 who were already with them. So we want to rejoice with you. If you're visiting with us this morning, thanks for being a part. I want to encourage you guys. The doors are like right there, but before you get there, hang out, make a new friend, invite somebody to lunch. Um, let's get to know and to love one another. Amen. And if you need prayer this morning, as always, we have people that are here to pray with you. God bless you. Go in his grace. Go in his power. Go in his peace. And we'll see you again next week.